Okay, big round of applause for the Bat Camp. That's yet one other thing we love about Emerald City. The people here are easily amused. <laughs> no, no, Siri. Okay, we're ready to start now. We're, we're, we're going to do it for real. Everybody, welcome to the Eternal Batman panel. <laughs> I want to say at the start that we love Emerald City. We love this convention. This is a great city. This is a great convention. The, our writers and artists love it. You people are great. So we're, we're happy to be starting off the, uh, the convention season here in, here in Emerald City. So give yourselves a round of applause. Now this is called the Eternal Batman panel, but it doesn't mean it goes on forever. So we only have, uh, we only have a little less than an hour. So, so let's get started. Um, I'm going to bring up our guests. We have Plenty of great guests here. We'll get into a lot of great stuff. First up is, uh, he's new to the Bat Group, uh, writer Tim Seeley. <laughs> Next up, you know him as the, uh, the writer of Constantine and Pandora, uh, Mr. Mr. Ray Fox. Yeah. <laughs> High five. Next is the, uh, you know him as the writer of, uh, well, he's done some Talon, he's done some Red Hood, he's done some Batman, Mr. James Tynan. Woo! <laughs> and last, we stuck him all the way down at the end of the bench by, uh, by accident. Um, what can I say? Uh, Court of Owls, Death of the Family, Zero Year. Please welcome Mr. Scott Snyder. <laughs> I know, I know, I forgot somebody. I'm sorry, I got, so I got excited about Scott. Um, also, the terrific, terrific, terrific Batman artist. He can do baby Batman with big heads. He can do regular serious Batman. Mr. Dustin Gwynn. See, that's what happens when you get Scott Snyder on a panel. You know, you just sort of lose it a little bit. Okay. Um, Let's go to the next slide. This is going to be a big year for Batman. I don't know how many people know this, but it was almost to the day, March 30th, 1939, that uh, Detective 27 hit the, uh, hit the newsstands. Um, Bob Kane and Bill Finger. So Batman, we are celebrating the 75th year anniversary of Batman. Um, so we've got, uh, we've got a whole year of fun stuff planned. Um, there'll be a lot of stuff coming up. Um, but right now, all I got to show you is the cool logo. <laughs> all right, so 75 years of Batman, that, that means something. Um, we're going to start, uh, we're going to make this a little bit of a celebration of Batman. I'm going to start with, uh, you know, warming the panel up with a, uh, oh, with sort of a, uh, uh, an opening question for everybody. Favorite Bat moment? Favorite Bat moment. We've got <laughs> 75 years of movies, television, comic books, novels, all that sort of stuff. Um, Tim, give me your, fa your quintessential bat moment. It's a tough one. I had to think about this last night, but uh, I decided it was JLA 41, where Superman is overcome by despair because this bad guy called Mageddon. But uh, Batman gives Superman a pep talk that ends with, get this done or I will haunt you till the afterlife. <laughs> so Batman tells that Superman, like, that is the greatest thing ever. So, yeah, you know he means it, too. Yeah, he yeah, means yeah. it, yes. Yeah. That was uh, a good one. Ray, what do you got? Oh, for me, uh, the quintessential Batman moment for me is... Um, in the fourth issue of Frank Miller's Dark Knight Returns, there's this moment right after Batman's basically saved Gotham six different ways, and uh, he's alone while he's riding the horse, and he slumps in the saddle, and uh, the description is that he, he sort of slumps over like an old man, and then all of a sudden he straightens up, and there's this look of total awe on Robin's face, and she looks up at him and says, he can't die. That's a good one. That's a damn good moment. Nice one. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, for me, I think it has to be the, the, the sword fight in the sands with him and Rachel Ghoul. Uh, just the scorpion, the, the, the Neil Adams art, it's just like the, all of it like, is perfect. Are, are you a man or a fiend from hell? Like, I don't know, that, <laughs> that whole sequence, the, the scale of it and the scope of that, those stories just always stay with me. James, that was probably what, early 70s? Yeah. Were you born when that came out? Nope. <laughs> okay. James wasn't born when JLA 41 came out. <laughs> <laughs> or Dark Knight Returns. Or Dark Knight Returns. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think I got that one. Yeah. Yeah. I got that. 
<laughs> what do you got, Scott? Um, that's hard, man. I, I would probably go, honestly, I think, the, not to crib off of Ray, but um, for me, Dark Knight Returns is still my favorite Batman book of all time, followed by year one. And uh, it was the moment when you first see him, when he, he first appears in that, where he's descending, you know, that big splash. I copied that maybe like 20 or 30 times. I wanted to be an artist before I wanted to be a writer, and I would just trace that one, copy it, and then just put my own superheroes in that pose, you know? <laughs> like Catman or whatever, like to Meerkat, you know, or whatever, just terrible heroes all in that same pose, because I think ultimately the thing that I loved about that, looking back, is just that it was, it was the first time, that book was the first time that I, I, I was only 10 or uh, nine when that book came out, and um, to, to see a superhero sort of approach with such, pathos but also such um, incredible respect and dignity and to see him have this heroic moment after you've seen him be this old guy with a mustache and it just it, you saw it and you knew Batman would be around forever you know what I mean and then he could always come back so mustache or not Batman survives <laughs> it's bat stash he was so huge too in that picture I remember yeah. that oh, he's like, yeah. see if I had gone first I would have said everything they said but um, I'd probably say in um, the Batman Beyond series where um, Bruce Wayne was going crazy, and you know he, was, he thought he was going crazy. He kept hearing this voice in him, and he kept trying to convince everyone that he wasn't crazy. And then Terry, Batman Beyond, says, how do you know, at the end, he's like, how do you know um, you weren't crazy? And then he's like, because the voice kept calling me Bruce. I don't call myself Bruce. And, then, and I thought that was like, you know, this guy's crazy. Everybody has a quintessential Bat moment. Um, think about it. And you know what, at some point maybe we'll, uh, maybe down the road the website will ask for your quintessential bad moment. So just start thinking about it now. And uh, we'll be back in 75 years to celebrate the 75th anniversary of Scott's meerkat. Man. <laughs> that okay. means he has to launch it today. <laughs> <laughs> let's, uh, let, let, let's, go to the, let's go to the comics. Who out there is reading Zero Year? I want to make sure we, we encapsulate this. Uh, but before we get into the zero year, um, just so you know, I mean, you guys have been reading Batman, right? Uh, Scott and Greg's run on Batman since, since the beginning, right? Yeah. In this day and age, to have a book run 30 issues at the level of quality and the, the, always at the top of the charts, uh, the sales charts, month in and month out, despite whatever, whatever event is coming along, uh, event of the day is coming along, <laughs> They're still number one, month in and month out. This is unheard of in, uh, in modern comics. Scott and Greg, I, I, I think about this all the time. Scott and Greg are doing something just, just truly unheard of in this day and age. And well, they deserve all the credit in the world. So that's a cue for a round of applause. <laughs> so now, Scott, zero year. When you yeah. wanted to do this, tell us. Tell us a little bit about yeah. uh, why you wanted well, to do this. Thanks a lot, guys, for being so supportive of the whole story. I mean, what happened was um, DC sort of came to us and said that Batman was one of the few superheroes who had not had a, an origin um, sort of redone uh, for the New 52 in a modern way. Um, you know, basically everybody else had uh, pretty much, you know, Wonder Woman, Superman, all, you know, and, uh, and Aquaman and so on. And, um, you know, at first I was like, there's no way I can do this. Uh, I, you'll never top year one, you shouldn't go near it, it's just sacred material, but I started thinking about it. Hey, then they were like, well, you know, we could always ask someone else to do it, and I was like, no way, we'll do it. Because <laughs> I don't want somebody else making up the origin for Batman, if, you know, it's our, it's, our, it's our version of him. Um, but the thing that really spun me on it was um, growing up in the city in the 80s, I mean, the thing that was so powerful about year one was that that was Batman in your city. I mean, now it seems timeless, I think, because we've all read it so many times or, you know, we're so familiar with it. But that was, that was shocking, the way DKR was shocking back then, to see him encounter a Times Square, or the equivalent of Times Square, that looked like Times Square where I was a kid. And you, would, you would go to get, like, firecrackers or fake IDs or whatever, but you couldn't really go there when it was dark because it was dangerous, you know? Um, and so I was thinking about, you know, maybe we could do it in a way that was sort of an inversion of year one, where it was big and bombastic and crazy, and addressed a lot of the kind of fears that, you know, you have in a, in a city and in a country today. And how to make Batman, maybe we could do it in a way that made Batman, or our version of him, kind of mean something else and inspire something else. And then I got really excited about it, started thinking about, you know, Superstorms and the, and the Riddler and the idea that we could make the city almost post-apocalyptic, which is what's coming up. I mean, if you come by my table, I've been, I, I'm not supposed to, but I was like showing sneak peeks of this spread that we did when you open the next issue where 
Bruce wakes up from being knocked out essentially for about three weeks. And he wakes up and opens the, blind, the curtains in this apartment he's staying in, and he sees the city, and it's just devastating when you see it. I mean, Greg spent three days on this spread. He actually, he sent me a thing I just showed them like five minutes ago. He was like, I just want you to see, this is for that spread. And I opened my text, and there's a picture of this guy shot like twice, like, like just brutally murdered in the next issue. And I was like, wait a minute, that looks like me. <laughs> and it was, <laughs> it's totally me. And he, he, he killed me in retaliation for making him do this spread, but it's an amazing, <laughs> it's worth it. I'm really like shot up too. I was like, it's like angry murder. But anyway, um, the, the point is, um, <clears throat> that what's coming up in Zero Year, we want it to be a culmination where the Riddler essentially says, we live in a different time than, than uh, uh, the, in this unprecedented time, you know, where these pink hairless creatures, we've got no, no fangs, we've got no claws, and the only way we survive our own demise is to evolve um, psychologically, is to, to use our minds to outthink, you know, our, our own death. So we get cold, there's an ice age, we invent mittens, you know, and so on. And he's like, so why don't I speed the circumstances up in Gotham and make it this end of time city? So he uses Poison Ivy's research, and he uses the Superstorm essentially to flood the place, and he's had access to Wayne Enterprises and Powers Enterprises arsenals. So he turns the city into his own almost post-apocalyptic playground. And it's gonna be, it's really fun. I'll show you the spread if you come by. Um, but I wanted, that this part coming up is the crescendo. It's the culmination. It's the thank you to you guys for letting us do all of the kind of sacred material before it. This is the fun part coming where he faces off with the Riddler in a completely transformed Gotham. Um, so that's, that's what it's really about for me. It's about trying to do a story that makes Batman face the fears that we have today between sort of, you know, everything from terrorism to, as silly as it sounds, like, you know, climate change with the Riddler sort of bringing this in and saying, look, at superstorms and floods and we need to outthink these things and I'm gonna let it flood the city and you're gonna have to save the city. And so you get subway systems just flooded with Batman desperately swimming through and sharks and lions and all kinds of crazy stuff. So it's super out of control. Um, I couldn't be uh, happier with it. I'm, it really is the thing I'm proudest of that we've done. You know, uh, just because it's, it, was, it caused us so much anxiety, I can't even tell you, like, how many <laughs> nights, he'll tell you, like, how many nights, I literally was like, oh, God, I, maybe I should just quit, you know, this, because it's, you know, you're dealing with material that you grew up r revering, and you still revere, and th the fact that you guys have been so supportive and kept the book where it is, and the reviews, and the comments, and it really means the world to us, you know, we were terrified doing this story, but it is the thing that meant the most to me and Greg, and once we started it and I laid it out, I mean, there was definitely kind of like, are you sure you want to take it this crazy, you know, from, from editorial a bit? But it was like, no, if we're going to do it, we have to do it that nutty. So thank you, honestly, from the bottoms of our hearts, our twisted hearts, for letting us, <laughs> letting us do this, because I, I really, it really is my favorite thing. And then afterwards, I guess, we'll come back, we'll do some really small, we're going to do a quick, dark detective thing, and then we're going to launch into... I can't say what it is, but we're going to launch into like definitely a, a, a shorter story. It will not be 12 issues or anything this long, but um, something that's going to rock Gotham in, in definitely the, the craziest way we've done so far. So for the 75th, you have to, right? You have to go big for the 75th. I can't be like, these are going to be one issue or two issue arcs. So that's kind of what we have planned. Well, I think we got some artwork from, uh, from Batman 30. Oh, you do? Um, oh, sorry, yeah, just talk right through it. No, don't worry about it. Um, yeah, can you see? It, you see, that's Gotham now. It's like flooded and overgrown and completely, basically ruined. It's about, I think 11% of the city is irreparably damaged. The entire border is flooded. The center of it is overgrown, and the Riddler has sort of, um, every day at 6 o'clock, he comes on that big board. And there's a big sort of, uh, not to spoil everything, but he comes on that board at, at sunset and he challenges the city. He says, any one of you that can step up, your, your mascot's the knights, right? So be the knight, rescue the city, answer the riddle, or come up and beat me in a battle of wits. Riddles essentially to him are these primal battles of wits. And historically they are thought of that way in a lot of cultures where you know, the hero has to prove himself by going up and answering an, an unanswerable question to either rescue the princess or save his land or redeem himself or whatever it is. And that's the way the Riddler sees it. He sees it as this burned down battle. And he says, I can't figure out how to make the city adaptable to the, to the end of times that we're about to face. So who's smarter than me? Really, he's just a narcissist and he's like, no one is smarter than me. But he's sort of like, come up and ask a question I can't answer at sunset in front of this giant billboard where I, and he's hiding and no one knows where he is. You know, and I will just give you back the city. And so that's what Gordon is kind of looking at there. I love bearded Gordon, right? He's like the last of us, like badass Gordon. <laughs>
That's Bruce standing in Crime Alley. That's the brownstone that he was in at the beginning of the story. That's a beautiful page. Isn't it great? Let yeah. me ask you this. Um, Riddler. Is it hard to write the Riddler? Because you've got to write all these really great riddles. riddles. Yeah, the riddles are really <laughs> hard. I always I call them up late at night, and I'm like, is this smart enough? You know, because you think, like, oh, riddles, they'll be easy. But then you wind up being like, why is six afraid of seven? You know, and you're like, those, that's horrible. Because like, I mean, he's got to be, like, crazy smart. So yeah, riddles are really rough, but he's a joy, he's a joy to write because honestly, the, the way I try and pit him against him is that he sees that Batman prides himself on being a detective and essentially, you know, being a, a detective means following like a set of empirical clues in a closed mystery and getting to the answer. And that's essentially the riddle, uh, what the Riddler is doing is he's saying, well, then I'm your perfect adversary because I'm going to set up a question you can't answer, you know? So that's why they kind of, they think they work really well facing off. And they really face off in the next issue. The next issue, on th the one coming out, 30, is easily one of my favorites that we've done. But 31, when Batman like shows up to face off the Riddler, it's like the best. It's the splash. I was like, if I get one page from out of like all 30 issues we've done, Greg, I want this one. <laughs> so you'll see. <laughs> OK, really um, issue 30 comes out April 16th. So yeah. Scott's favorite, 31, look for it in mid-May. Right. Well, this, yeah, I, I mean, it's not, I, I don't mean, I, they're like your babies. It's not like I love that issue more than this issue. It's just that that one has my favorite splash. The 31 has like this Batman, like in his most badass moment that I think we've done. So he, uh, this is him basically deciding that he can't save the city, that he's failed twice going up against the Riddler and that Alfred convinces him essentially that, do you really want Batman to be a symbol of failure? So this is him actually leaving. I gotta say too, I don't, I don't know about you guys if you're with me on this, but I'm a big fan of the Riddler. I always have been. <laughs> and uh, I used to get into fights with my friends all the time because they would tell me the Riddler was lame compared to a lot of other villains. And uh, I'm happy for many reasons these days, but one of them is I think after zero year, no one's ever going to argue that the Riddler is lame again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we've got uh, zero year going on in uh, the flagship book in, in Batman, um, but also launching in April is our new weekly title called Batman Eternal. Um, and that's the, the brainchild of, uh, of these guys here. So, uh, James, why don't you take a whack at explaining this book? Oh, my God. Okay. <laughs> well, I mean, it was really about a year ago when uh, we started, uh, when they came to Scott and I to start thinking of ideas. And we wanted to come up with a story that was big enough to encapsulate the entire universe of Bat characters and uh, something that was worthy of picking, being picked up every single week. Uh, something that had enough threads, had enough mystery, uh, had everything about it that, everything about Batman that uh, we as fans and you as fans want to see so we can keep you coming back. And we saw this as, uh, you know, a perfect opportunity to get into some of the smaller corners of Gotham uh, that, you know, we haven't gotten to explore yet in the New 52, um, and, but also just and elevate all of those. Uh, and, you know, I don't know. I, I'm yeah. Yeah. The, that's exactly it. And I think also, on the flip side, you, I mean, what, what, what was great about um, uh, the idea of being able to explore all the kind of different uh, tangential characters and characters that we don't normally get to see from Leslie Tompkins to, you know, to the, the, all the extended Bat family, the Gotham Gazette and the police force and everybody, um, bringing in new characters. Um, the other thing is that this, the, the, you have so much room that you can tell the craziest, most, most sort of over the top story also that changes the whole city. So what, what we figured out was that um, we would do a story that really, you, I think you could tell from Batman 28, like, things are vastly changed as, as soon as we start, really. In issue one, you'll see something happen that really changes the entire structure of Gotham. Um, we want it to be a series uh, that essentially sets up the status quo of Gotham so that the, you see this becoming, this is where you go to kind of see what Gotham is so that when we get back from Zero Year in a few months, we're gonna hit the ground running with this continuity with everything that you saw happening to Catwoman, what you'll see happening to you know the power structure in Gotham, the criminals, everything. So, and where the story goes is just you'll see from page one. We want it to be something that you know we get the opportunity to tell a story that's so big and so nutty that we need 52 issues to do it. Right. Yeah, we have some interior pages here that we can. Can, can you see that one? Thank you. Quick see. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. 
it's, you know, bad things happening with <laughs> Jim Gordon. <laughs> but bad things never happen in Gotham. Oh. No. Yeah. Um, here, let's go to the next page, too. Let's see if there's more bad things. Oh, yeah. So we got some Professor Pig action. I, I was so happy with uh, that, that opening image we wanted to, uh, on uh, that page. Uh, we wanted to kind of have that Batman and Robin running moment, but with Batman and Gordon. Uh, and I love what Jay did with that. That just sounds funny. Some Professor Pig action. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is, the, this is the only place you can say that and have it make sense. <laughs> now, th explain to me the, uh, this is, let's underscore that this is a weekly. So when it starts, uh, it, it drops uh, um, April 9th, and it's going to come out every week after that. Um, how do you guys work on a weekly book? We've got uh, the, the four of you are writing really it, right? Really, really <laughs> hard. <laughs> uh, I there's, mean, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of reading and a lot of yeah. talking between all of us yeah. to make sure that everything fits and everything works and that everyone's <laughs> voice still comes through, though, right? So we all kind of champion different parts of Gotham in this story and different parts of Batman, in a way. Um, so, yeah, like we're, we're constantly, as we're writing... Uh, our individual chapters, we're constantly reading each other's and, and sort of, I'll, I'll put a scene into Tim's chapter and Tim will put a scene into James and, and you know, we'll, we'll do this back and forth. So uh, it's, it, we hope it comes out really seamless. We feel yeah. like it is, but, but uh, there's a, it's, it's a very involved process. We have a nice skeleton that um, James and Scott sort of started with and they gave us that skeleton and then we each kind of broke it down. And we're doing this weird for weekly, right? Like you yeah, 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 write yeah. five pages at a time or something. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. Everybody works in every issue. We're not doing that really, no. but we talk to each other constantly. Yeah, um, right. I see. You, I talk to you guys way more than my mother. Because <laughs> like, we're constantly, you know, kind of checking up to what this thread is and stuff. Um, but it's very fluid because it has to be. But luckily, like no one's. We all just go. I don't know. Scott said it. It's totally the thing. Yeah, it's kind of it's yeah. kind of the way it's been set up. It's kind of easy to get us all talking all the time because the way we've approached it, it's, we've got you know sort of five writers with very different sensibilities, but um, uh, all, all I I would like to think all really really great talents. I believe so of the other guys at least. And uh, um, so what happens is we all we're all working on aspects of Batman and Gotham and, and Batman's universe that we personally love. And so oftentimes when we're discussing this with the other guys, we're getting them fired up about what it is we think is cool. I mean, for me, uh, I love the darkness of Gotham, right? And it doesn't take much for me to get these guys excited about something really creepy and strange happening in the city. Yeah. Right. Here, let's show the, uh, the next slide, which is the, the cover for issue two. Oh. Yeah. That's a good one. Mm. Yeah. So. Which portends some bad things for, uh, for Gordon. Yeah. Um, so now Jay Fabok is uh, is doing the first four issues of uh, mm -hmm. uh, of the weekly, um, um, and then well, obviously the one artist can't do the you know the entire weekly, um, so they'll be uh, they'll be switching off. Um, and Dustin, which which issue uh, do you make your debut on in uh, for for Batman Eternal? I don't know. Four. I think four. it's four. It's, four. it's drawn, four. but like. Yeah. They just tell me to draw, and then I just draw. <laughs> <laughs> is it four? Yeah, yeah, I, think yeah. it's, I think it's four. It's a race script, right? That's yeah. A, okay, yeah. No, that's six. Okay, it's four. four. Six. Yeah. It's four? Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's either four or six. Yeah. Well, so now when you got the script then, you're four issues into it. Um, the, the, the train is already up and running, so you're coming in sort of late. Did, did, what was your reaction when you saw the, the script to see what they had, you know, uh, the, uh, this The train's crazy? late. No. Um, <laughs> You know, it was crazy. It was just, I've never really, I, this is my first time working on a weekly. So to, um, you know, and first thing you do when you work on a weekly is you make sure you got to coordinate because, you know, everyone's kind of working on, you know, I could be working on, I guess, like issue 15 or 16. Mm -hmm. Someone's still working on you know, issue six and seven. So we're referencing back to each other and, you know, you got to make sure you everything. So once in a while, I'll go back and like, oh, that character wasn't designed yet or, you know, wasn't made yet, but now he is. So we'll go back and we'll make sure it matches up, you know? And um, yeah, it's just trying to make everything happen because once that first book comes out, we know that it's every week it comes out, you know, mm -hmm. so. The weird thing too is we're, I think, for me it's so weird to realize, like we've been working on this for what, six months now? We have 34 issues done, I think, <laughs> which is insane. Cause I like, well that wouldn't even come out until next Christmas or something. Yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, like we're so far ahead, we, well we have to be because of the grind coming up of every week a book coming out, but. Um, yeah, I've read up to like 34, I think, which is, yeah. you know, 
<laughs> madness. Ahead of the game. It's madness. Yeah, it's madness. Yeah, I mean, it's just crazy that this is something that we've been work working on nonstop yeah. since around September. September. Yeah, like, and it's it's strange because the turnover in comics is normally so fast that like when you you write a script and then a few months later it's out on the stands and. Uh, now, uh, but you know, now people are going to start seeing something that we were working on <laughs> six months ago, and we're wrapping up the story. Yeah. Um, it's, it's cool though, because I mean, it's yeah, like 52 issues of this. You know, we have a lot of room for a lot of stuff, but Gotham is huge, so it turns out that the scripts are actually really fast moving. Yeah. They're typical really writer talk right there. Yeah. They're, yeah. Very They're dense. like, oh, we just write it and it comes out. Yeah. You forget we have to draw them. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. Here, I think we got the cover for uh, for issue three as well. Yeah, I mean, uh, what is it? I that's the Batmobile. That's, that's a super exciting either. Batmobile shot. That's the cool thing with this yeah. too is that we don't always see. Well, we haven't seen the covers really. We've seen the interior, but we haven't yeah. seen all the covers. Well, here, why don't you switch places with the audience? And you can <laughs> yeah. That looks awesome. Yeah. And look, you know what? I think we got the cover <sighs> number four too. We could spoil the whole story. Oh, yeah. Okay. I've seen that one, so well, it's not that cool to me. Tell us so a little bit about Batman this one. <laughs> well, that's uh, that's Batman and Batgirl having a minor disagreement. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder if it has something to do with a you know, cover to number two. And they're standing somewhere where apparently it's very dangerous to stand because there's lightning all over the damn place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I never understand. They always go really high like, and isolate themselves on like, a gargoyle when there's lightning. Just, not <laughs> smart. Just carry a big <laughs> metal bar around, why don't you? Yeah. And it's only raining where they're at. <laughs> Okay, so I don't want to pick that apart too much longer. So let's let, let's go let's go to the next one. This is some of Dustin's art, oh, yeah. right? Yeah. Very nice. Yeah. Dustin, what were you thinking here? Can you um, see I'm it? thinking I have Batman jump down, Batgirl, <laughs> five panels, and goons. <laughs> <laughs> right? That's Why good. I'm, uh, I'm glad your mind doesn't wander anything. or anything like that. <laughs> um, well, if we could take it, I think we got another page of Dustin's artwork here. Dustin, what are you thinking here? I'm going to draw Batman <laughs> jumping down. <laughs> <laughs> you have to pick the page where I drew the same Batman. <laughs> Making me look bad, man. Okay, sometimes, we, we, we're we're going to have to vet up. Dustin next time we put him up on. I just, we, I just only write him jumping down. <laughs> <laughs> He's just always jumping. When I get the script, I'm like, did you write anything with Batman jumping down? Because <laughs> I want that one. Yeah. <laughs> He never jumps up. He only jumps down. <laughs> yeah. There's, that's not Superman's thing. There is only one <laughs> way to jump. Yeah. Superman's only... thing is jumping up. Yeah, yeah. right. He's like, Dustin, I'll, I'll do, you ever, do you ever get a page where, um, no, I don't want to draw that. Can we do it this way? Um, I do. I mean, sometimes you do, but it's, you know, that's usually the challenge where you're like, well, you better make this good, you know, <clears throat> even if you don't want to draw it. But most, most of the time, I mean, if the whole story flows, it's required. And, you know, it's going to be good. Okay, well now the, the, the whole group, um, once you guys get through these 52 issues, what are you going to do then? Well, I hope we're going to do 52 more. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're like, th you've written 34, 35 of them so far. Yeah. You're, you're still jazzed to, to go totally. on more? Absolutely. Okay, so it'll be up to the, to the audience to see if we want, uh, yeah. mm -hmm. we want more. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It is weirdly like most fun I have uh, writing. Honest yeah. to God, writing yeah. this book is the most fun I have. Because we become it's, like a club, right? right? We're talking all the time. Yeah, right. and it, it, like, it <laughs> seemed like it was going to, like, w it seems like something that should be, like, the most stressful project I'm working on and all that, but it's just been such an easy We're totally jinxed process. it. It's going to suck next week. <laughs> <laughs> right after we build the clubhouse. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, the, yeah, first, issue the, of, uh, the first issue of Batman Eternal comes out April 9th. And then weekly after that. Mm. The, mm. And one last thing, maybe just to say about it is just you guys, I know it's hard to like wrap your head around the idea of why would I buy this weekly series or this, oh, oh, like, what, why are they doing a weekly series? Or, but for us, like, the idea was they came to us and said, we'd like to do this, this type of a series and we want to do it a certain way where everybody does five pages and, you know, it, it needs to be modular, that kind of stuff. And they were, you know, DC was great about letting us just reinvent that structure and James and I were talking about it and we were like the only reason to do this is if we do a series it's essentially a celebration of Batman 75 years this year and we totally changed the mythology in it so that when I get back from zero year I can dive into something crazy whether it's like Bruce Wayne you know comes back and has has found that everything is wildly different you know or when you and he will see the city 
changed and taken from him and characters like Catwoman elevated, characters he needs like Alfred, things happen. You saw someone else in the cave in, in, you know, in 28. And so we wanted it to be a place where we could tell this crazy story and that each of us would get a chance to do uh, a narrative or an arc that would explore the parts of Gotham that we love while always clicking that big machinery forward towards this horrifying thing coming at the end. Do you know what I mean? So it was constantly like, you get to write an arc about anything you want, but just push that horrifying thing a little bit further down the line so that we can move it and move it and move it. So you're going to see all your favorite villains basically in the series. You're going to see, you know, basically everybody's status get completely changed up. And, you know, the mythology turned on its head because we really felt like anything that we want to do this year, you know, it has to be this year. It has to be for Batman 75th if you're going to try and really, you know, shake things up in, in a good way that's true to the core but gives things, you know, challenges the characters. It has to be this year. So That's a cool, like, you know. Like, also, I think we got really fired up working on this. We're hoping that you guys are going to get really fired up reading it because in the end, one of the things we said was that um, very little is sacred, right? So there's going to be... Oh, huge changes. There's going to be characters who sort of switch places on the board. Some of the evil characters will end up basically doing good and vice versa, right? Like, everything is going to uh, modernize and change. Yeah, with Arkham, mm -hmm. every, I mean, there isn't a place in Gotham that isn't crazy, like, touched in a way that will make you surprised, hopefully in the best way, where you're like, I never thought that was possible, but that's a really interesting status for that. So, yeah. so buckle up and get ready. <laughs> April Killing 9th. everyone. April 9th yeah. is the first issue. They all become monkeys. That's the first now. issue, yeah. <laughs> everyone's dead. Okay, we got some time. We have, uh, we have a microphone out there, um, but this is a small enough room, so if, uh, well, now we should probably line up, don't you think? Yeah. It's probably okay. better. Yeah. I think the rules of the room are if you have questions, line up, at the, line, at the, line up at the mic, and we'll take them one at a time. Okay? All right, then, that's it. All right, see you later. <laughs> don't be shy. This guy wanted to, but he stopped. Go ahead. You go. <laughs> right. Okay. Somebody's going to break the ice on the question. My favorite is when someone comes up like dressed like the scarecrow or something, and they'll be like, my question is about the scarecrow. <laughs> <laughs> That's always my favorite. <laughs> um, so this, Scott, this question is specifically for Scott, but all of you guys as you're writing on this series, um, I know with you, you have a family with two Two young kids? Yeah, two boys. And so how does that influence your writing? Um, and I mean, obviously, the writing that you, you know, that you do currently in Batman, maybe you wouldn't show to like a, a five-year-old or something like that. It's more like Little Gotham. Yeah. But um, do you ever plan on doing something for them? And then, so that's, I guess, the one part. And then the second part would be just how does having a family influence your writing? Well, I mean, that's a great question. Uh, I don't write it for them, you know. I don't let them see it. Uh, although my 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 kid, my older kid is like all he's into is villains. I just was showing this picture. I went to his school and and all the pictures were like unicorns and rainbows that the kids drew. And his was like this is and the teacher had written what they said it was on it. And it was like this is a picture of a kitty cat being eaten by a giant squid. <laughs> and it actually looked and it actually looked it was like this little kitty cat falling into this maw of like tentacles. And I was like that's my kid. And my wife you know and my my wife was just like uh you know sorry and uh, so. He's definitely displaying some really interesting <laughs> tendencies that I feel like just sort of seep into him. Like he, you know, he, he likes bad guys. Um, but no, I, 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 keep, I keep the stuff from them and I do think about that. I mean, but ultimately the way I, I try and write Batman, the, the only way, I, I try never to make it um, offensively dark or grotesque. Um, but I have to make it about personal demons. I mean, the, the only way I feel like it's possible Sorry if this is sort of, you know, sausage making, whatever, but the only way that it's possible to write an iconic character like Batman is to figure out how to make it, how to make it about your, what you love, that Batman, how you, what you love about the way in which Batman can overcome the same demon that you have deep down about something. So for Joker, for me, that was really about, we were about to have our second kid, um, and I was terrified of being a dad again and thinking to myself, like, God, I wish I could stop worrying about the first kid once in a while. Now we're going to have another kid, you know? And, and I remember thinking, well, Batman has this extended family. He must worry about them. And then I thought, well, what if somebody just heard that thought and thought to themselves, I just heard you say you wished your family was dead so we could go back to the way it was before and you wouldn't have to worry about him anymore. And that was Joker, you know? So I knew that that was where the story went. And similarly, Zero Year, the final 
part of it is very much that a different, a very different element of you know my sort of what what I love about Batman and his heroism and his sort of the tragedy about him, but it's deeply personal in the same way. So the only way I can do it is to just not worry about like think that they would be proud of me one day for for trying to be you know honest on the page with it and not do anything sensational or or you know shock value or whatever but yeah make, make it as dark psychologically and emotionally as it needs to be you know for for it to be real and potent to you as a writer otherwise i feel like i'm just you know i'm just doing plot and I, I just can't do that. I mean, I if I feel like on Batman, if you're not doing that, you might as well let somebody else write Batman because everybody has their story that means the world to them that they want to do on Batman that's deeply personal, even if they don't know it. And if I wasn't doing one of those, I would feel like let someone else write Batman, you know. So as long as I have those stories, I'll stay on the book. And I do have, you know, a couple more. So that's how I kind of think about my family. It's, it's always very weird to go to a soccer game and have like, you know, I'm like, literally just finished talking to him and I'm like and then he'll cut off his face and he'll strap it onto his face and then I'm like oh good goal you know Jack rock on you know like go son you know I mean uh, but um, I don't know that's just that's just my life you know I, it's I guess. interesting too that Eternal is actually I, we didn't notice it when we started but it became really about dads too and I'm not a dad I have a dad though and uh, <laughs> I noticed that the when we're working on the book it's like I think James and I were like wait we're we're telling a lot of father stories here. And I think that's inevitable with Batman, you know? It's yeah. th that he is that figure. I Dustin, a lot of Dustin you have stories. kids. Yeah. Um, but yeah. How did how did having kids... Uh... Um, well, I was going to say, you mentioned Little Gotham's... Um, I did Little Gotham's out of spite, because my kid is, like, a huge Green Lantern fan, and I was very disappointed. And I was like, dude, I'm going to do something so good you're going to read it. <laughs> so, so, you know, I, I was like, I hope you read this. And so I did it in... You know, he's still reading Green Lantern. <laughs> I failed. But but you, you know what? You won my, my daughter over. So. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, that, that's the tagline for Little Gotham, a book born of spite. spite. <laughs> <laughs> Screw you, son. That's the take, take that. Next question. So out of happenstance, my, my question is actually about the extended family. i uh, kind of curious on your take on um, how, how kind of they changed the dynamic of Tim Drake and, like, love how they built up some of the Robins and, you know, just the history of some of the Robins, but they've kind of tweaked it as well. And I was just kind of curious if you're kind of disappointed that they took him out of being a Robin or just, um, or if you had James any thoughts like, on yeah, that. James or? is yeah. the Tim Drake guy. I, I don't honestly see it as all that changed. I think okay. in the New 52, uh, we haven't seen uh, Tim Drake as uh, an active member of the Bat right. family because his whole tenure as uh, now Red Robin, but when he was, you know, Batman's sidekick, that happened in the sort of right. the missing five years that we we haven't seen those stories. So, but now, um, yeah, but they've actually written it out, haven't they? they where well, they no, said no, that no, because he was he, he was still uh, well. He was he called himself Red Robin, but uh, uh, from the start in right. the new continuity. But he's, uh, I don't know. In my yeah. head, Tim Drake is my favorite character. In well, yeah. all of comics, and that's like one of the major goals of, like we talked about how there there are stories in mm -hmm. that each of us sort of have taken lead on, uh, and the story that I've taken lead on in uh, one of the stories I've taken lead on is the Tim Drake uh, and Harper Row uh, storyline that's going to run through the full year, okay. uh, and that that starts in issue five, I think cool. that where. He, he's going to start coming in front and center. Nice. Uh, I still see him as, uh, you know, I think he is a very important linchpin to the entire Bat family. I okay. think that, uh, you know, he's a very different Robin than Jason or uh, Dick right. ever were. So he's the I, detective. Yeah. yeah, and we're going to see exactly his own his own little means of defiance and how he uh, he. He doesn't do thing. He doesn't like authority. He doesn't like someone looking over his shoulder, which is one of the things reasons I think the the fact that he never he just called himself Red Robin out of the gate that actually kind of fits because he makes his own way. Um, and uh, I don't know. I'm I'm really excited for you guys to all see more Tim Drake Gotham. Cool. Goodness. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Thanks. You guys are the best. Um, with Eternal. 
having such a complicated and intricate storyline, rich storyline, and so many cooks in the kitchen, do you guys have an ending point planned out? Are you building upon it as you go? Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Scott and James actually are the sort of uh, overseers. They're sort They're of the, 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 the grandmasters. Yeah, I prefer and, uh, overseer. Yeah. Showrunner. <laughs> <laughs> and they, uh, they, they laid out this, uh, this skeleton document that we all began with, and that document had the end game of this story in it. So we've known that from the start. We're just the meat. <laughs> Basically, <laughs> James we, and Scott are totally the skeleton. We're the meat. How do you like that, Ray? Oh. Meat. Just meat. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, we know the ending going in, which helps a lot. I think you, you know. I actually, I, I, I can't write a story without knowing. Yeah, you. I have yeah. to know the ending yeah. too. And honestly, and I, they're, the preview for the first issue's out. The we start at the end, so you'll see uh, <laughs> how uh, you know how rough things are gonna get right at the start. Oh, you get and a glimpse of it. Yeah, a glimpse. Yeah. Uh, so nice. Yeah. Thank you. So it's there at issue one. The, you get a glimpse of the ending at yeah. Yeah. issue yeah. one. Yeah. Okay. We just give away the ending in issue one. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> we just spoil the whole story. It's like, oh, all the mysteries, here's the solution, and then it's like, let's start the story now. But it's we don't like really. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I like, um, I like Thriller as well. Um, and it's great. We're seeing him in the zero year, but will we see him after the zero year just as strong as he is right now? Or Yes. Yeah. And would there be a chance where we might see Ray Shalgo in the zero year? Or in zero year, no. Uh, but you, I, I'm not gonna. I mean, I, you'll definitely see. You know, he, him in general. Yeah. I don't. I, I don't want. I don't want to. I don't want to say where he's gonna pop up. Back, Ray Shalgo plans. Yeah. They're. Okay. They're I just very wanna solid. want to see like another big Ray Shalgo like Tower of Babel kind of like this huge scheme where he's like, I'm going to change the world. Like you can't. You have to win every time, like he says. He only needs one win. I want to see that type of plan again. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, in answer to your first question, um, early on in Eternal, the Riddler leaves a message. That's one of the creepiest things in the entire story, and, uh, and that really message creepy. plays a role in, in the story. So, yeah, you're going to see more of the Riddler, and he's, just, he's just as bad. Does it include the punctuation posse? <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I think, I think really, we're going to really have to. I really want to. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> make that happen. I mean, this question's more for James, but you can all kind of chime in because you're all writers. Uh, as far as like creating a new character that you kind of want to introduce into the fabric of bat lore, like with Talon, like how does, how does that kind of feel? Is it really daunting or is it just kind of like an exciting thing because you got to carve out your own corner and all this? How does... I love it. I, I like world building. It's one of my, like it's one of the reasons that I was really drawn to uh, working on Eternal. Uh, for instance, like one of the pieces, and I think I've talked about this before, is uh, the Gotham Gazette is something that, you know, as just as a fan, I was always like, why don't we, why don't we go further into the Gazette? Why isn't there a larger cast there? Who's the guy who literally wrote the book on the Joker? Like, what crime writer in Gotham wrote the bestseller across all of America on, about the Joker? Because that book has to exist in the DC universe. Mm -hmm. So it was like, Adding in figures like that, developing, uh, just broadening the world, uh, I, I love it. And uh, in Talon, it was great, especially, you know, uh, tying in uh, elements from, uh, like, with uh, Casey Washington's group of, uh, you know, refugees. Uh, basically, you have uh, a former League of Assassins character, you have a former... Um, Basilisk. You, you have people who were in the Yakuza and the mob, and it's just like, it's creating the, um, it's filling in the web between all of these different points, and which I think it strengthens the world. Um, and uh, so I love doing it in Talon, and I'm loving doing it in Eternal. Thank you. I wanted to share my favorite bat moment, if that's okay. Go ahead. Yeah. And, it was, uh, and then ask a question, if that's okay. Uh, uh, Scott, it was uh, issue five, I believe, when you guys flipped the page upside oh, down. Thanks. <laughs> I don't know about everybody else, but when I read that, I thought it was a misprint. Yeah. And I turned the comic repeatedly, and I read that like five times because it was so <laughs> amazing, so oh, captivating. I, I sat there on my couch afterwards, I was like, my mind is blown. <laughs> so I was like, this is just so good because it was just so just out there, and it was quirky, and it was crazy, and it was awesome. And you saw Batman overcome through like just being drugged and just shoved down in this pit all by himself surrounded by all these crazy people 
and then he somehow is able to triumph over that was just amazing for me. Thank you. And getting, getting me that, I just felt all that emotion. Right now I'm just like shaking thinking about it. <laughs> and, uh, and then uh, a funny question, um, why would anybody bother to live in Gotham at this point? We like, agree. Does, does, does nobody have any common sense to know that there's like a, a rogues gallery of people that are like feasting on the civilian population? Uh, we and uh, have vigilantes that are like running around the city. Isn't that enough cue to we, say, okay, it's time to move, move? We actually, I think Scott was the one who forced us to ask that question when we started working on Eternal, and we have answers to that in Eternal. Why would you want to live in this city? Um, I mean, I mean, I live in Chicago, and that's... <laughs> <laughs> I think, yeah, that, that, that's a big part of, uh, in the first arc in Zero Year, it was yeah. something that we wanted, I wanted to address about Bruce. Like, why, why does he love the city? Why does anyone come to Gotham? And I think ultimately the reason they do um, is because they know that it's this great adversary, and, you know, you go there and... You know, similar to a place like New York, or I mean, you could even imagine your hometown that way. You know, it, it, wherever you're from. But I mean, ultimately, you 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 live in a place because you know that it's going to challenge you to be the thing that you really want to be, but um, aren't sure you can be. So Gotham, I think, you go there to become something. You know, that your own hero, whether that's being a doctor or you know a social worker or whatever it is. You get off the bus and you go there to do that, and Gotham will throw everything it can at you to break you. But if you can make it through. You know, and Batman's this crazy example of somebody who defeats everything, or at least even when he loses, comes back over and over to prove that he can do something. You know, you become your own hero. So I think that's that's my only, you know, that's the only way I can justify people living in that city. <laughs> Although I'd say on a ground level too, the Gotham City Police Department must be the highest paid police department in the entire <laughs> city. <laughs> By the way, about that page, that was really, when we first did that, the funny thing, it was Greg's idea, because I was saying like, Let's, let's do something with the book that makes it disorienting. Maybe we do a spiral or whatever. And he was like, I have an idea. We'll flip the thing. And you have to do like Greg. Greg has this crazy voice. You know what I mean? Where he's just like, dude. Yeah. So he was like, yeah, let's do it. And I was like, let's do it. And then DC didn't want to do it. And they said it was going to be a misprint. And he wrote this impassioned email that was like, sometimes you have to be a fool. You know? And, just, and it was like, remember? And he, like, he was like quoting Bill Gates and like all this stuff. And then I, I was just like, I was just sending emails that are like. I was reading like, Mr. T right there. Yeah, I know. It was like, fool. <laughs> He is kind of, he has that thing. But then I was kind of like, I was just like chiming in, you know, behind him. Like, I was like, yeah, in an email. I'm like, yeah, 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 we do. And then finally they did it and they agreed to do it. And we were like, haha, you know. And then it came in PDF form when we first see it, which you scroll through vertically. So we saw it and we were like, see, you know, what were they being so, so they're being such pussies, man. Look, it looks fine. And, uh, you know, then we got the book, and I got it, and I turned it, and I was like, oh, my God, there's a misprint. It's not supposed to go like that. <laughs> and so then I tweeted out. I was, like, I was like, oh, just so you know, everything in Batman number five is deliberate. And within 30 seconds, Greg called me. He's like, don't be a wimp. He was like, if they don't get it, they don't get it. He's like, if they don't get it. And I was like, ah, you know, so I deleted the tweet. I was like, oh, whatever. <laughs> and, then, and then the funniest thing was, like, within half an hour, he went on Twitter, and he's like, there's a goddamn misprint in Batman five. <laughs> and I was like, I called, I called him up, and I was just like, dude, you know, you take your own medicine, stop it, you know, and what, and uh, so we saw it, and we had forgotten how, like, what it would actually physically be like to turn the book, so thank you for saying that, yeah, it was, no, it was that a lot was, of fun. That was so out of this world, it was such a great experience just to read, and uh, I, I, on a side note, I wouldn't want to argue with a guy with guns that big, so. Totally. They're big, he's, he's huge. You know the one that, Thanks, guys. when that book came out, if it's digitally, did it? Turn to because you have you no your computer screen. You, turn. To, you have to lock your. You iPad. have to lock it right. Yeah. Once you start turning, you're like, damn it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we're uh, we're we're running up against a deadline here, so uh, last three questions got to be really quick. Okay, this is gonna be pretty quick. Given your druthers, I mean, 75 years of Batman. There's lots of villains, lots of people. What like Z grade villain? I mean, we're talking ten eyed bandit level villain. <laughs> Would you want to go and reboot? <laughs> For modern best, the ten eyed Okay, man. quickly, uh, quickly down the down the lane here. Uh, the, your your what, like, your what, what was it? Z grade villain. villain your lamest to. villain that you wanna that you wanna reboot. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's funny because well, we won't ruin it for you. Uh, well, we can ruin one of them because we, <laughs> we have a whole some bunch of them. In Eternal, um, I, I brought that in Eternal. I bring the ten eyed man back, and <laughs> and he is the most brutally weird David Lynchian character you are ever going to see in this comic. I thought he should have had the old costume. I was like, I think that's awesome. But you guys thought it was stupid, so whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I have a crazy quilt idea. Yeah. I really do. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. I would do Condiment Man. Like, yeah. Condiment Man. <laughs> but like a serious version. You know, not ketchup and mustard. Like, 
sriracha or something. <laughs> <laughs> something serious. <laughs> yeah, that's a serious <laughs> condiment. <laughs> Okay. okay, that's the new dark. I'll do that with you. Uh, we're, we're not going past the Ratchet Man. Let, 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 let. <laughs> uh, are we going to see more, or maybe there is, of the uh, future cloning Batman in 27? The, the, that short that was. I I'd love to. I mean, I'm t I'm talking about doing. You're gonna see. You're gonna see some things coming up that tie into that a bit, uh, both in Zero Year and in another issue. So you'll start to see that future. In, our, in our, my imagination, that is sort of our version of Bruce's fu future, regardless of whether it eventually becomes the actual continuity future. Everyone has their own version of Bruce, and that's kind of where ours heads. So you'll see, you will see more of it. Now, as soon as Sean is open, Sean really wants to go back and do a miniseries in the Mad Maxian one or the Pacific Rim one. Um, but he just, he's got, he's doing this, he's doing a book with Mark Millar, and he's doing a couple other things. But so hopefully we'll get to it. Thank you. Okay, last question. Uh, last question. Uh, I just wanted to know if any characters or anything will be picked up from the Batman Inc. run, or will we see any of yeah. those characters pop yeah. up in Batman There's a lot Eternal. of those guys in Eternal. I love that book, so. And I yeah. shared a studio with Chris Burnham, so I saw it constantly. So <laughs> I, I won't let them get forgotten, because I, I, you know, I had yeah. to look at it every day. So. Yeah, major <laughs> villains, major main characters from that series are going to be uh, key, key parts of Eternal. I threw Lord Deathman into Talon also, so yeah. there you go. <laughs> and we've already established that there's some Professor Pig action. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. You said it dirty, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Something about Larry just makes it so sort of well, sexy. Well, everything you Professor, said, everything Professor Larry Pig's says. a little bit dirty, isn't yeah. he? Yeah. yeah. Okay, there's some hot bacon action from Larry. After the panel, you can tell me how to say it without sounding dirty. That, that, <laughs> that, that'll be fine. Thank you all for coming. And we'll see you later this afternoon for the, uh, the DC All Access panel at uh, 5 o'clock. 5 o'clock this afternoon, same room. <laughs>